Well, welcome to our third part of a study on Martin Luther's little book, one of his seminal volumes on Christian theology called Christian Freedom, which we published a number of years ago now uh, with the title How to Live a Christian Life. Because when we talked about Christian freedom, ultimately people get that mixed up with uh, political freedom and all sorts of other freedoms that people wish to have. Today that word means a lot, freedom. And even though we'll talk about it during the Bible study, this idea of Christian freedom, um, ultimately uh, this book is all about how the Christian life is lived. Who are we as Christians? How do we function? What's going on, on the inside? Already we've had wonderful discussions about the old man and the new man, and we'll come back to that here in a bit, in a few weeks. Last week we had a, an interesting discussion on the soul and the flesh, soul and the body. And lots of good responses to that discussion of the soul and the body. And we certainly didn't answer all the questions. And the reason we didn't answer all the questions is because it's a huge, a huge topic. And maybe you've never thought about it before. And our discussion last week on the soul and the body, the inner and the outer man and their relationship to each other was new to you. And so it opened up new vistas theologically for you. And you started thinking about things you've never thought about before. That's wonderful. That's how knowledge is gained. That's how we learn. Uh, I had a similar uh, occurrence in my life when I first stumbled upon World War I. And you say stumble upon World War I. How did you stumble upon World War I? Well, in school, we learned all about the Vietnam War. And, of course, we studied the Civil War. We studied the Civil War, I think, three times. Once in junior high, twice in high school. We hit the Vietnam War there. We also talked about the Cold War, because that was going on still then when I was in high school. But we never talked about World War I. We might have touched on it, I think, in ninth grade. But that was it. This war that happened that we took a little bit of part in right at the end. But then the more I studied World War I, its place at the beginning of the 20th century, and its impact on philosophy, on religion, on theology, on society. It turns out that World War I perhaps is the pivotal event in the 20th century. But you don't know that unless you've studied it and taken a look at it. But by doing so, it opens brand new vistas to you that you've never seen before. So the same goes when we take a look at new theological concepts. And it doesn't mean uh, that you have a faulty knowledge of theology if you've never understood these things before. It, you're just like Nicodemus going to Jesus at night and asking him questions and learning new things. And you'll continue to do this your entire life if you continue to study uh, the Christian faith by reading your Bibles and by asking questions. And this is what Luther did. I mean, Luther comes to, the, to discover the gospel of Jesus Christ by reading his Bible. That's it. I know people don't like that simplicity there. But not only did Luther read his Bible, but he read it repeatedly. He translated the whole thing, Old Testament and New Testament, Hebrew and Greek. And then he continued to preach his entire life. He preached at least three times a week, three times a week on average, um, to the extent that we have somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 sermons of Martin Luther. 3,000 to 4,000 sermons of Martin Luther. Uh, most of them have not been published in English. We've got an, a nice smattering of them. We've got a good collection of them in English. A lot of times our English sermons uh, from Luther are compilations of sermons, like he, he would preach the, uh, the same, on the same Sunday every year on the same text, but a different sermon. Someone went along, came along and took all those sermons on the same text, put them together into one super sermon. And so we have these books with those super sermons of Luther, and we think, wow, he really preached for a long time. But no, when you look uh, the sermons up in the, the actual uh, critical editions of Luther's writings, uh, so many of them are very short. You know, they're 12 minutes, they're 15 minutes. They're not 45 or 50 minutes or an hour. Uh, that it would take you to preach the sermon that you would find in, for example, if you're familiar, the Lanker edition of Luther's sermons. And so uh, the thing that kept Luther grounded in the Bible his entire career as a theologian was that the fact that he had to preach and preach continually his entire life, three times a week. 
Most theologians don't have to do that. Most theologians don't have to preach much at all. Um, a theologian at a seminary, for example, might preach three or four times a year in the chapel at the seminary. If they have a vacancy or covering a vacancy in a congregation, certainly they'll preach every Sunday. But if they're not, uh, they're only preaching three or four times a year. That is, they're standing up publicly and trying to explain the thing that they're teaching every day in the classroom. So it's an interesting point to make that Luther's theology really is worked out in his preaching. The theology, his understanding of Scripture And he learns to understand it better and better and better the more he preaches. And he returns to texts and preaches on them again and preaches on them again. There's a very interesting book that came out a few years ago. And I'm sorry, this is really frustrating, I know. And it's not available in in English. But I just wanted you to know that such a book exists. And that's The Theology of Martin Luther According to His Sermons. Okay, So somebody came along, read the sermons of Luther and said, well, if I had nothing else except his sermons, what could I grasp about Lutheran theology. This is what this book is. It's a very fascinating, fascinating uh, book and helpful too. So tonight we're on chapter 3, chapter 3 of this book, How to Live a Christian Life. Put this symbol here, that's the sign for Christ. That's the first, that's the first two Greek letters of Christos, okay? Uh, The Greek uh, translation of Hebrew Aramaic. We'll hear more about that tomorrow night. Uh, in the sermon in our Ascension uh, service. We'll have an Ascension service here tomorrow night at Prince of Peace. It'll be at 7 o'clock. It'll be Vespers. Uh, please join us. We'll be uh, streaming that live tomorrow night, an Ascension service, as we celebrate the Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it mean? What does it mean that Christ ascended into heaven? What does that mean? That's what we'll be talking about tomorrow night in our Ascension service. So please join us. Please join us if you can tomorrow night. So, chapter 3, page 21 in this edition. I hope some of you have been able to download that from lutheranpress.com. I looked there today. It's very easy to find and uh, very simple to download. So I hope you can do that. If you have a Kindle reader or if you have any type of reader, it's a PDF file. You can put it on that reader and follow along that way. Uh, The Word of God, in general, contains just two teachings. These teachings are the law, and the promise. The Word of God in general, that's what we're talking about, the Bible, okay, contains just two teachings, two doctrines in general, and that is the law and the promise. Now that was, that's, uh, you know, Luther's known for that distinction, this law and promise distinction, that when you read Scripture, you're looking at uh, God speaking to us in law, God speaking to us in promise. Maybe better as um, law and gospel, okay? Law and gospel. But we're going to put law and promise up here tonight because that's what Luther writes here, law and promise. And the problem with promise, of course, is that when we grab the term promise, we think about the promises that God made, the political and historical promises that God made to his people in the Old Testament. And people get all bent out of shape about those. People um, today spend their entire life trying to figure out how each individual promise God made in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New Testament or is waiting to be fulfilled. That's not what this promise is about that um, Luther is talking about here. What he's talking about here is the good news of salvation through faith in Christ. Good news of salvation through faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. And... Maybe Diana will <laughs> type that in um, every week. Might be losing it again here. So we're going to have to go to Wireless 2, I think. And uh, if we go to Wireless 2, we might have to... Oh, we'll try this a little bit longer and see if... Okay, so if we can switch them right now... There we go. Well, that sounds better. That even sounds better, doesn't it? I have a deeper voice. Should have started with two all along. Become somewhat of a baritone instead of a squeaky tenor. (laughs) So, 
What's the difference here? Good news of salvation through faith in Christ. Think here of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The promise, if you believe this, then you will receive this. If you believe, then you receive. (laughs) If you believe, then you will receive. (laughs) Sounds really good. But that's the concept of promise, right? Here's the promise that God made to you. If you believe the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, your sins will be forgiven, and when you die, you'll go to heaven. If you believe the promise. Now, since, I don't know, Karl Barth came on the scene, he's a Reformed theologian, the most prominent theologian of the 20th century, who's wrong about a lot of things. We've kind of gravitated to the idea of the gospel And that is just the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. Not wanting to talk about the promise because, of course, the promise brings into the question faith, Christian faith. You have to have faith. You have to believe the gospel in order for it to be effective. And Barth gravitated more to the idea of, no, the gospel is just proclaimed. The gospel is proclaimed and it works. It just works. The gospel works. And there's all sorts of other problems there too. But by just saying it's law and gospel, what we're doing is we're saying the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins and not belief in the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins. Well, I can proclaim the forgiveness of sins all day long, and if you don't believe that, then it's of no avail to you. All right? I can proclaim the gospel. I can teach Jesus. I can talk about him. I can can tell you all about him, what he did. Uh, who he was, who he is, what he's doing now. But if you don't believe it, then it's of no avail to you. It's of no use. So that's the, that's the emphasis of promise, okay? God promises you something if you believe. Gospel is just the idea that God has made this promise, this gospel promise. He's made this promise to you. And that's a wonderful thing because ultimately uh, the distinction between the law and the gospel are vast, or is vast. Now, where do we get the distinction? Later on in the book of Concord, the distinction uh, shows up in John 16. John 16. It's where we find this distinction of law and gospel. And I wanted to go there just real quick. Members of the congregation have been here many times, but it's a pivotal, it's a pivotal passage for understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in these end times in law and gospel, John 16. And now, in, in uh, John 16, 5 through 11. And that's that whole passage of uh, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll convict the world of sin. Okay, and that's the law. Convict the world of righteousness because I go to the Father and you don't see me any longer. That's the promise, okay? That's where we get that distinction of law and gospel. Uh, and, of course, Satan is judged, okay? Convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The judgment of Satan, okay? We need to be comforted. Remember what the Holy Spirit is. He's the comforter. How do you feel better about COVID-19 now? By believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do you feel better? Why aren't you waking up in, in terror? Maybe you are. Maybe you have. Maybe you've sat there and felt the whole weight of this entire situation Um, pressing you down, falling on your shoulders. And then you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You heard about about Christ. You read the Psalms. You sang a hymn. And suddenly that weight was gone. It was gone. You weren't thinking about it anymore. What happened there? That you weren't, one moment you're thinking about it, the next moment you're not thinking about it. The Holy Spirit came and worked in your heart. And And he worked in your heart, pushing you towards this promise and in that promise, comforting you. So it's not some random distinction that Luther makes here by saying law and promise and the two basic teachings of the Bible. Because we're also going to see that this is the distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Hmm. Ah, okay, now we might be getting somewhere. We're going to be covering some huge themes tonight. And we, no, we're not going to be covering them. We're just going to touch on them. And then we're going to run away real fast because they are huge themes. But you can't just say, well, pastor, I don't understand, so they must not be true. 
Pastor, I can't grasp it, so it must not be. So I'm just not going to think about them. I'm just going to do what I want to do and try not to. You know, the more you know about Jesus, the more at peace you will be. It's as simple about that. It's as simple as that. Okay? The law teaches us what's good. Now listen to this. The law teaches us what's good. It does not, however, accomplish what it teaches. So the law of God, and here we think primarily of the Ten Commandments, okay, given to Moses on Mount Sinai, written on our hearts. And when, when we're conceived, the law is written on our hearts, but then it's also given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Ten Commandments. Here's what God would have us do. He tells us what to do. But he doesn't give us the power to do it. And I was thinking about this today. Because I'm a pastor, and that's what pastors do. <laughs> and that's just like a, a tennis coach saying, here, just hit it this way. And, oh, there it is. Look, he did it. Look, that, and then you try. The coach telling you how to do it and telling you how to do it and what you must do doesn't give you the power to do it. If you're a basketball player, how many hundreds of hours did you stand on the free throw line and practice your free throws? Didn't the coach come along and say, hey, just do it this way. You know, two bounces, make sure you bend your knees, make sure you use your whole arm and extend. Did that make you a good free throw shooter? Should we talk about golf? Should we even go there? Even the professionals have their own coaches who are telling them things constantly, but not giving them the power to do it. Yeah, that's the right way to do it. But that doesn't give you the power to do it. This should be easy for us to understand. So get that out of your head. Get that out of your head, the idea that, well, God wouldn't give us anything to do that we can't do. So why would he give us the Ten Commandments if we can't do the Ten Commandments? It's part of life. Life itself is looking around saying, oh, that's how that is done. But it doesn't give me the power. I can understand how it's done, but it doesn't give me the power to do it. We used to sing that, song as kids. You know when you're the pastor's kid, you learn a lot of songs. You go to camp, Sunday school, you sing a lot. Do you remember the song, Oh, Who Can Make a Flower? Did you ever sing that one? Oh, who can make a flower? And it was all about all the different things that God can make, but we can't. Even though we can see, I mean, you know how, we know how flowers grow now, right? Photosynthesis and all these different things take place. Can you make a flower? No, but God gave you flowers. Why would God give you something that you couldn't make yourself? Get rid of that logic. Boy, it's insidious. It really is. The law shows us what we should do, but does not give us the power to do it. The law was established to show man himself, and we've talked about that. Through the law, a person has shown his own powerlessness to do any good. The law forces a person to abandon the idea that he, in fact, has the strength to fulfill the law. You know, the, the theological use of the law is that of a mirror. A mirror, yeah, I said mirror. And, you know, I always joke that if we were all beautiful people, <laughs> there's so much humor when we go down this road, if we were all beautiful people, we wouldn't need mirrors in our houses because the reason we have mirrors in our houses is not to see how beautiful we are, but to see how ugly we are. We look in mirrors for mistakes. That's why we have our mirrors in the bathroom. We go in, and it's kind of weird. We look at the mirrors. Do we really want to talk about how we look in the mirror when we close the door and nobody else is in there? How close we get to the mirror to look at ourselves, to see what mistakes there are in our face that we have to fix? Every day, the mirrors are there to show us how good-looking we are not. Now, you could argue, well, pastor, if you're really good-looking, you want mirrors just so you could see yourself. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> but for the rest of us, the mirrors are there just to show us our problems. Uh, we, used to have this <laughs> we used to have this rule on camping trips, there would be no mirrors. Because if no one had a mirror, 
uh, if anybody had a mirror, they'd have an advantage over the rest of us. <laughs> and so one of the rules was no mirrors. And so, uh, of course, the kids would go over to the vans and the trucks and look in the mirrors to try to figure something out. <laughs> but eventually they got the hang of it. They just woke up and uh, came to the table and we all just laughed and that was it. Um, the law of God should teach us that we need to abandon the idea that we can fulfill the law, okay? Because the law works in such a fashion, it's called the Old Testament. For example, you shall not covet. You shall not covet is a law by which we're all convicted of sin. No person can stop coveting, even if he tries extremely hard to do so. That's an interesting thing. You know, the, this idea that sin occurs before we can stop it. We see something, we're like, oh, got to have that, Right? Or, oh, they've got, that's not fair. They ha I want one of those, right? That happens so quickly. That happens so quickly. Thoughts pop into our heads just so quickly about all sorts of different sins, right? This is what happens. And this is what Luther is pointing out. Luther is pointing out the law is showing us that that's the case, all right? The word effective in this way. In order that a person may fulfill the law and not covet, he's forced to abandon the thought that he is able to avoid coveting, all right? It's kind of like... Um, when I would play tennis or when I'd play golf or I'd try, the one thing you had to get rid of was the idea that you actually knew what you were doing. And same was true when it came to music. Uh, when I took uh, vocal lessons in college, um, you come with preconceived notions about what you should be doing and how you should be doing it, and maybe you've done those things for years. And the first thing the good coach or the good teacher will have to do is disavow you of all those notions to show you that what you're doing is wrong. And then you have to really be convinced that what you're doing is wrong because if you aren't convinced that what you're doing is wrong, there's no way the coach can teach you the right way. And that happens in music and singing, in music performance, in playing instruments. It happens in athletics. And, but it also happens intellectually in the classroom. Okay, a little more, a little less obvious there, but in music and sports, it certainly happens all the time. And you have, um, we had a guy once on our basketball team that basically was kicked off the team because he refused to be coached. He knew what he was doing, and the coach just got tired of trying to correct his bad habits, and he would not change, wouldn't he? and he wouldn't even admit that he needed to change. And so that was it. He, wasn't, he was no longer a member of the team. He's forced to abandon the thought that he's able to avoid covenanting. He must look elsewhere for help. This is what the prophet Hosea was getting at when he wrote, He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. Yeah, we're against God, against our helper. One thing, you know, God doesn't just take us and modify us. He destroys us, and then he rebuilds us. And unless we're willing to be destroyed, we can't be rebuilt. This is really a powerful idea. God just doesn't take us and says, hey, you're doing pretty well. Let me just add a few things here. Let me, let me correct that a little bit, add a little bit, take a little bit off there. Oh, looking good. No, he completely and totally destroys. And then he rebuilds. And how does he completely and totally re destroy? Through the law. That's what he does. Here's who you are. Here's who you are. Here's how you really are. That's me. <laughs> One of the things you have to get over, and, and, and uh, we, we have a couple of musicians here at the church. We have a lot of musicians here at the church, but one of the jokes that goes around amongst the musician, musician bleh, 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 amongst the musician, <laughs> where's that gone? <laughs> okay, try it again. Amongst the musicians is this idea of get over yourself. Because, of course, when somebody makes a mistake doing this or that or anything else, myself included, you know, you feel bad, and, and, but everybody else says, well, that was fine, but you knew it wasn't fine. Oh, we all need to get over ourselves. And the proof's in the pudding. You miss the note, you miss the note. Okay, that's what you are. Okay, get over yourself. So we've been joking about that. But we all need to get over ourselves. And when the law is put into our face. This is who you are. That's what's going on. When a person, uh, what is done by just this one law, covenanting, 
is done by them all. All the laws of God are equally impossible for us to fulfill. When a person has been taught his own powerlessness by the law, he becomes concerned about the way he will fulfill the law. Well, if I can't, what am I going to do if I can't fulfill the law? After all, the law must be fulfilled. No jot or tittle of it will pass away. This is what Jesus says, right? That's the quote from Matthew 5.18. For truly I say to you, unless heaven, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. You know, that's not an I, not a dot of an I, will be removed, okay? When a person has been taught his own powerlessness by the law, he becomes concerned. If a jot or tittle does pass away, a person has not fulfilled the law and is condemned. Realizing that he has no ability to fulfill the law, a person finds in himself no reason for his justification or salvation. Okay, if I can't fulfill the law, how... What am I going to do? How can I stand before God? He's righteous and holy, perfect. How can I stand before Him if I myself don't have the capability to fulfill the law? This is what the law does. And that all, that's all it has to do. And that's, I mean, the, the, the biggest issue today is not with the gospel of Jesus Christ. People like the gospel when they hear it, <laughs> if they ever do hear it. You know, all sorts of things coming out of churches. Rarely, it seems, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But they like it when they hear it. It's almost too good to be true. But what they don't like is the law. And so the biggest issue is still the law. The, uh, the confession of sin. They say, no, that's who we are, sinners. Okay? If you don't want to be a sinner, you don't need Jesus. Because Jesus is only for sinners. Yeah, he's not there to pat you on the back and say, hey, good job. Way to go. I don't even know why I came down here. You're doing so well. You're doing so good. At this point, the other part of the word of God, God's promises enter. The promises of God declare the glory of God, saying, if you want to fulfill the law and not covet, believe in Jesus. Believe in Christ. In Christ, God's undeserved love is promised to you as well as justification and peace and liberty. And that's not liberty as in Liberty Bell or Sons of Liberty or Take a Liberty. It is Christian freedom, the idea that through faith in Christ that you can live each day not being hounded by people saying, you have to do this, you have to do that in order for you to earn or gain God's favor. And if you do not do this or do that, you will not. Here are the 27 things you have to do. Here are the 59 things you have to do. Here are the 45 things you have to do. No. Believe in Jesus Christ. And you are justified before God that is made righteous, deemed righteous, declared righteous and holy. I mean, that's the way the law works, right? Even when somebody is uh, guilty and guilty of a sin, if the law declares them not guilty, they are not guilty. Shall we talk about O.J. Simpson? Right? That still sits poorly in people. Okay? Shall we talk about other people who have been declared not guilty when they were guilty? Right? But since the law declares them not guilty, they are not guilty. Not guilty in the law's eyes. Okay? So if God declares us in His righteousness and holiness through faith in Christ to not be guilty Hold on just a second. Pastor's getting his microphone rehooked up. There. Voila. Little French. Okay, that was free. All of these things will be yours if you believe. Look at the next sentence. None of these things will be yours if you don't believe. Okay, so that's why we get back to this idea of promise dependent on faith. Okay? If we stick with the gospel and just simply talk about the gospel declaration and then just it creates forgiveness by just being declared 
and not being believed, then we're, it's almost like we're turning the gospel into God's uh, election. That's interesting. That's a deep track. I hope you still listen to the rest of the Bible study. All these things will be yours if you believe. None of these things will be yours if you don't believe. What is impossible for you to do by all the works of law, which are many and useless, is easily and completely possible through faith. That is to be declared righteous before God. So you're not earning your righteousness before God. You're being declared righteous by believing in Jesus Christ because then the righteousness which is His is credited to you. Right? It's not belief because, oh, belief is a really good work. No, 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 no. By believing in Jesus, what is His is credited to you. And that's what makes it so wonderful. Okay? The fact that He fulfilled the law is credited to you. All right? Whoever has faith has everything. Whoever has faith has everything. Don't need anything else. You don't need anything else. Whoever does not have faith has nothing. You have everything in the world, every physical possession in the world. You can have your health, you can have popularity, you can have all these different things. But if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, you have nothing. Okay? That's it. And you know it, ultimately. You know that this is true. If you look down deep side, inside of yourself, but if you're not going to look down deep inside yourself, that's not going to occur. So, uh, let's see here. All right. Whoever has faith has everything. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. That's right. In order for God to forgive everyone, he has to condemn everyone, and he does that through the law. Here's who you are. You know, kind of like those, <laughs> the old, this is how you are. Well, this is how you are. And little kids sometimes do that. It's kind of funny when they do. It's not funny when you're a kid, but it is funny watching little kids do that. <laughs> The promises of God give what the law demands and fulfill what the law commands. So that's a big sentence there, right? The promises of God, the gospel, give what the law demands and they fulfill what the law commands. The law and the fulfilling of the law. God alone commands, God alone fulfills. So God commands the fulfillment of the law, the Ten Commandments, and then he fulfills the Ten Commandments through his son Jesus Christ who fulfills them. And then he credits us with that fulfillment which we receive through faith in him. You know, I, I talked about it last week maybe or the week before where I said, you know, the righteousness which is, uh, which is Christ, all the gifts and wonderful things he wishes to give to us, they're available to us kind of like the internet's out there floating around, but we can't get at it unless we have a connection. And once we have that connection to the internet, then suddenly all the things that are on the internet, we're just talking about the good things, they come flowing down into our computer and we can enjoy, you know, uh, Pinterest recipes of chocolate chip cookies, uh, YouTube uh, instructional videos on how to change the brakes on your Mazda, um, all these wonderful things that come flowing down. Well, through faith in Jesus Christ, all the wonderful things that are Christ flow into our hearts in the same way and they're there. And we don't need anything else then, which is wonderful. Because then we don't live in a needy state. We live knowing that all the things that we need will be provided for us. That's the point. We don't live getting up each day, oh no, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? No. Okay, I'll, I'll say my prayers, and then I'll get up, and I'll do what I need to do that's been placed before me by God. Oh, there's my husband, there's my wife, there's my child, uh, there's my dog, there's my cat. Well, I don't know about cats. It's just joking. <laughs> the promises of God, therefore, belong to the New Testament. Better yet, the promises of God are the New Testament. Right? That's what Christ called the Lord's Supper, right? The New Testament. It's a New Testament. Hmm. That's interesting, especially for those people who have eschewed, that's a neat word, eschewed, I like saying it, eschewed the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Because the promises of God are words of holiness, truth, righteousness, liberty, and peace, and are full of universal goodness, the soul clings to them with a fur, 
the firm faith. Now we're talking about the inner man. The soul clings to them with a firm faith. The soul is united to them. The soul is thoroughly absorbed by the promises of God so that it not only takes part in all of their virtues, but is penetrated and saturated by them. I know we don't like to talk about this. How else are we going to talk about us, ourselves? Soul and body. Huh. You can keep reading about that. I know it was, um, it was brought up. One of our listeners in Germany, uh, hi, brought up the, the, uh, the question about the Hebrew word nefesh, and, uh, or nefesh, and the idea that the, that, um, that soul referred to the entire body and not just to the inner part of that word referred not just to the inner part of man. But the problem is, um, first of all, uh, our Hebrew dictionaries today are, <laughs> they have their own history as far as translations are concerned. And the, the influence of rabbinical literature, that means the literature of the rabbis after the destruction of the temple, of course, is influential. But within Judaism itself, there's an argument about what souls are and how they function. You know, I was listening to a rabbi, um, it sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it's not. A few, few weeks ago on YouTube, there was a, a great lecture by a rabbi, I guess the leading rabbi in New York. And there he talked about how what he believed was that in the creation, all the souls of mankind were created. And that the creation will come to an end when enough children have been conceived to stick those souls into. Now, this is a rabbi, the leading rabbi teaching in New York. New York. You can Google it. I mean, you could Google uh, rabbi, souls, whatever. But he was teaching that, you know, all these souls exist now that haven't been placed into babies yet. Now, nowhere in Scripture do we find that teaching. Nowhere at all. Modern understanding, a Jewish understanding of, of or rabbinical understanding of souls, but that's not the same as what we find in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, certainly the, um, it's a question as to whether we can take the way the soul is described in literature dominated by rabbinical thought and say that is how it's taught in Scripture. Remember, God's a God of the living, not just of the dead. And we have this question of souls there. So it was a great question, and I didn't answer it in a very extensive way except to throw doubt upon the idea. And that was my goal. I don't know if I succeeded. <laughs> but I do know when we get into this world, there is layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of history and meaning that we have to really get into. It's, it's like a dictionary. You know what? It, you, everybody goes for dictionary for meanings, right? Well, what's the meaning of this world? Well, not going to happen in the dictionary. Okay, so we look at No, we don't. Who even? You Google it. And there's like sometimes seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 10, 11, 12 meanings to the word. And you're like, what is this? A dictionary is just a history of the usage of words. That's all a dictionary is. It's a history of the meaning of the usage of words. And so here's how it was used in this way, in this period. Here's how it used, here's how it was used here. Here is how it was used here. Um, my daughter-in-law, I don't know if she's watching tonight, she likes to say, sick. And what she means is, cool. <laughs> what she means is, good. <laughs> but she certainly doesn't mean when she says, sick that, oh, that's bad. I hope you need, you know, I'll give you some help. That's not what she means. But it's a modern usage of the term sick. <laughs> okay. Um, we used to say, uh, what did we used to say to dogs? Sick them. I wonder how that came, right? You know, go attack. That's what that meant. I don't ever remember saying that, but, you know, sick them. Um, my point. Because the promises of God are words of holiness, truth, righteousness, we, we talked about that. If the touch of Christ healed, how much more would his tender spiritual trust touch the word truly absorbed, give to the soul all that his word possesses? Now, 
Here the question is, is are you talking about the Word of God, i.e. the Bible, or the Word of God, i.e. the Son of God, as in John? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, or the word, and the word was with God, and the Word was God. Hmm. Because of that Word, the Son of God is in our soul. Um, wow. It is in this way, therefore, that the soul alone through faith without works is justified from the Word of God. Bible. It is justified, sanctified, clothed with truth, peace, and liberty, filled completely with every good thing, and truly made a child of God. So, St. John writes, But to all who did receive him, and here we are in John 1, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Hmm. There we go. So what we need, what we need is this gospel the promise to come into our souls and for our souls to embrace in faith this promise and then live in this promise every single day. Live in this way of looking at the world, of thinking about the world, of believing in the world and looking at each other and uh, treating each other and loving each other. And that happens by means of the Holy Spirit working within us. That's what's going on. And so what happens is, is the law really is the controller of our bodies. It really is the controller of our bodies. And in a very big way, the gospel is that which envelops our souls. Now, if there's no gospel there in our souls, um, boy, we've got problems. Because the spiritual, our spirit, then is flailing about, looking for something. Yeah, our bodies can go day to day, do this and do that, drive the car and go to work and like that person and text that person and eat with that person, whatever. But inside the soul is crying out, what am I? Where am I? How long am I going to live? What is the world? You know, what's going to happen to me when I die? All of these things, those are happening inside of us. And you know it's true. Don't lie. Oh, it doesn't happen to me. I don't think about that. Yes, you do. Everybody does. That's why we have these incredible works of literature. I mean, that's what was, what, what, what drove Hemingway to death, the writer, was the thought that after life there was nothing, that there was absolutely nothing. And that just... That became a theme of his later novels. This idea of nada. That there's nothing. There's other philo- philosophers, especially the uh, post-World War uh, I um, ilk residing in Paris that all developed that theme. Is there anything beyond life? And the answer was to them, no, there's not. And that's a horrible, horrible thing to live with every day because then you're sitting there going, okay, today will I become non-existent? I mean, you think there'd be comfort in it, but there's not because you're never sure. The gospel of Jesus Christ has to reach that soul. Say, yes, there is life. There's life now. There's forgiveness now. There's peace and tranquility now. There's this idea that you have everything that you need now, even if you have nothing here on earth except a piece of pair of shoes and a, and a pair of pants and that's it having food and clothing we should be content that's what we read right in Timothy First Timothy is that what that is I think it is everything else is cherry and whipped cream right everything else maraschino cherry and whipped cream yeah. my wife and I argue about that doesn't like the cherry go ahead um, we have a question from Sue. Do we get any benefits of Christ if we do our best? Well, most people do, Sue, but you don't. So don't even think about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding with Sue. Um, of course there is. Of course, of course you are benefited by pursuing godliness. You're pursuing godliness. But, and that's how you have, to, you have to think of it. And You have to pursue godliness. Uh, that is, pursue a life of the Ten Commandments. Um, not for its own sake, but just for the, because that's what, how you're 
how you are to live. And the whole idea of doing your best. Uh, my brother pounded this into me when I was a, a little kid. Uh, nobody can do their best. You know, it's wonderful growing up as the fourth child when you have three siblings above you and they're really smart. <laughs> uh, I don't live around any of them. <laughs> <laughs> love you all um, but he pounded into me the idea well nobody can do their best well what do you mean well could you have done just a little bit more could you have studied a little bit more could you have run a little bit further could you have practiced a tiny bit more could you and the answer is always yes so in reality, we never find out what our best is because we never achieve our best. Because even if we're the gold medal people in the world in some event, that's not satisfying to many athletes when they win the gold medal because what they're trying to do is get the world record. Because that means they're better not only than everybody in the race, but they're better than everybody who's ever run the race, or swam the race, or done whatever. I remember one time as a kid, I was in a swim meet, and my coach had sent in my time in meters instead of yards. And of course, when your time's in meters, it's a slower time. And so then I was put in this low heat instead of the higher heat. The higher the heat, the faster the times. I was in like the fourth heat instead of the twelfth heat. Well, I won by a lap. <laughs> and I did win the whole thing. But I had to sit through the rest of the heats. I had to sit through the rest of the heats to see if I would beat everybody else. The point was that I had beat everybody in my race, the other seven guys in the race, easily. But that didn't... I, had I done my best? No. And even beating everybody else, I hadn't done my best. So it's not a matter of pursuing this idea of best, the idea of, you know, of living the godly life. What does God want me to do when it comes to this, when it comes to that? Okay, that's what I'll do. Be content with that. Be content with pursuing a life of godliness. Yeah. Um, Melissa says in question 9, the verse Romans 15.4 is mentioned. Could you expand on that verse a little more, please? Yeah, let's, let's go there. Everybody, let's grab your Bibles. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Romans 15.4. Jack Baumgarten prepared these questions, and so if I can't answer these questions, I'll give you Jack's email, and you can just email him. And you know, later on tonight, he gets all these emails and wonder what's going on there. For whatever was written in early times is written for our instruction that so through perseverance and the encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. Right. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question because you sit there and you say, what was the point of, of Scripture in that sense? Because even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, where you have the law given, you have the gospel promises there as well, right? And chiefly, Paul points out the promises uh, made to Abraham, right? Abraham believed these promises of God and they were attributed to him as righteousness, and the writer of the Hebrews, Apostle Paul, points this out. Paul points it out elsewhere. That the promise is made of the promise to David. Someone will sit on your throne forever. I'll make your house forever. This promise as well. And, and the people had hope. So when Jesus first appeared, and one disciple asked the other disciple, could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah? We had hoped. Remember that? Remember when... Um, Jesus uh, joined the two disciples on the way to Emmaus and, uh, they, and Jesus was like, well, they didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. And they were like, because they weren't expecting to see Jesus. They didn't think he had risen from the dead. Um, kind of like when you'd see your teacher in the market, you know, in the grocery store when you're a kid. It's like, oh, that can't be my teacher. She's not up there at the, at the shop. No, what's my teacher doing at the grocery store? No, that can't be. That's what happened there on the road to Emmaus. And what did those disciples say to Jesus? We had hoped we had hoped that he would be the one to deliver Israel, right? So the promises were given 
to the people along with the law that showed them their sin, the promises were also given. An example, of course, of when the people sinned against Moses and grumbled and God sent the fiery snakes among them and, and they cried out to Moses and he, God had Moses make the bronze serpent on the pole and stick it there in the midst of them so that anybody who would look at the pole would be saved. Okay? These things were written so that we might have hope. Right? The hope's not in the fulfilling of the law. The hope was in the one who would come, who would eventually redeem the nation of Israel from all of their troubles, all of their sins, all of their problems. Okay? But that's a, that's a great question. Thank you, Melissa, for asking that question. Because otherwise you sit there and say, okay, when Luther says the Old Testament, uh, he's not talking about those 39 books. And maybe I need to clarify that. He's talking about Mount Sinai and he's talking about the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai. The political law, the theological law, uh, or the political law and the moral law and the ceremonial law. That's what he's talking about. That's the Old Testament. Not those 39 books of the Old Testament. Those 39 books contain both the law, the Old Testament, but also this promise, right? This promise of the New Testament. The New Testament's coming. Something new is coming, right? Uh, what, what musical is that? Melissa, we'll use, we'll, we'll use musical lingo. Could be, who knows, right? Is that West Side Story? That's West Side Story. Thank you. What was that song about? The hope that uh, Tony, I think it's Tony that sings that, that something's going to happen. Something's going to come. Something's coming. And, you know, even today, Jews still are awaiting, uh, they're waiting Elijah, right? And I forget which liturgy it's part of in, in Jewish culture, but they set a, uh, I think it's part of the, is it part of the Passover? Where they set a plate at the table, and as part of the liturgy, they get up and they, they go and open the door and they look down the hallway. They have the kids do it to see if Elijah is going to come. And... Why? Because the last book of the Old Testament says the great day of the Lord will not appear, will not come until Elijah reappears, right? The prophet that ascended into heaven or was taken into heaven, whirlwind and chariot. So the Jews today are still waiting for Elijah because Elijah then will issue in the Messiah. And so the big question, of course, when John the Baptist appeared, are you Elijah? That was the question, right? Because if you're Elijah, then that means, what well, the Messiah is going to be here. And of course, Jesus later identifies John the Baptist as Elijah. But what happens then when, when John is beheaded and Jesus then begins in full his public ministry? Some people believe that Jesus is John resurrected from the dead. Huh, that's interesting. But also you have the promise to Moses. I'll raise up one amongst you who will be for you this leader, this guide, the prophet, right? Because that was what was asked too. Are you, the, that's what Jesus was asked. Are you the prophet? Elijah, no, I'm sorry, John the Baptist. Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? So Elijah, who had ascended into heaven, never died. The prophet promised to Moses but then you also have the anointed one promised to David who will sit on his throne forever. These were all promises that people were looking forward to in throughout that history of the Old Testament from creation to the return of Israel from their Babylonian captivity. That's the Old Testament, right? We're looking forward to, remember, the last one being the promise made to, to Eve that one of her descendants would crush the crush the uh, head of Satan. And so when she gives birth to Cain, she says, I've uh, given birth to a man. And in Hebrew it says, it is the Lord. Now the, the Reformed translations all say, no, with the help of the Lord. But it says in Hebrew, it is the Lord. Now Luther pointed that out and he said, she's already believing the promise made to her that one of her descendants is going to fix 
what she did and what Adam did, causing them to be kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So she gives birth to this kid. Oh, well, this must be him, promised by God. But of course, Cain wasn't, right? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So great questions there. And um, yeah, anything else? We have anything else uh, at that point? Um, yeah, Pastor Baumgarten, throw these. Let's go through the questions uh, really quickly. What does the law do for us? It shows us our sin. Does the law give us strength to fulfill the law? No, it does not. What is the result of breaking just one law? Our damnation, right? Is there any law that is easier to fulfill? No, not really. No, not really. How perfectly are we to fulfill the law? Completely and totally. It's all or nothing. It's not a, oh, God's grading on a curve. <laughs> so I'm, and that's what people do, right? Well, I'm not perfect, but I'm not like that murderer. I'm not perfect, but I'm like, not like that person over there. They're much worse. All we have to do is find somebody worse than us to feel better about ourselves, right? And that's not how God, God doesn't grade on a curve. So can we justify ourselves? No. Can God justify us? Yes. Huh. So what promises do we have in John 20, 31? Let's close with that. Let's go to John 20, 31. Okay, John 20, 31. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing that you may have life in his name. If you wish to have life, if you wish to have the forgiveness of sins, if you wish to live each day in peace, in joy even, uh, with a clear conscience, believing that you have everything that you need, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's all it takes. Ask if your faith is weak, ask for a stronger faith. Pray for a stronger faith. If you think you don't have faith, pray for faith. But if you think you don't, you probably do, right? But believe in, your Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So tomorrow night, tomorrow night we have our ascension service here at Prince of Peace. And next week we'll be taking on chapter 4. And there's a lot in chapter 4, there really is. And I hope this was helpful to you tonight. Uh, tried to make it as compelling as I could in this short amount of time that we have here. Like I said, huge, huge, huge questions. Please write me. Uh, some people did this week. Please write me with your questions, big ones, small ones, um, uh, short ones, tall ones. Um, <laughs> Write them to me, send them to my email, and I will answer them for you. Okay, glad to see you. Hope to see you next week.